Hello and welcome to the Spencer Town Academy Arts Center. My name is Gerald Seligman. I'm on the board of the Academy, and on behalf of the Academy and its music committee, we have today another streaming concert to present. Jovino Santos Nato, a Brazilian pianist who's going to walk us through something of a pocket history of Brazilian music from people like Hermeto Pascual and uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim to Jovino's own compositions. But we, before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to here. And uh, you can find a lot of it on our YouTube channel for Spencertown Academy, where there are many streaming concerts, there are art classes, there are discussions and lectures with uh, authors and um, all kinds of interesting community figures. So check out Spencertown Academy on YouTube. But Jovino Santos Nato, he has uh, been living in Seattle for many years now. Before that, he was in the band of Hermeto Pascual for about 15 years. And anybody who knows jazz and Brazilian jazz knows that Hermeto Pascual is the absolute pinnacle of accomplishment and um, has a, a tremendous international career and is widely respected. So that's the creative cauldron that Jovino began in. He has since gone on to form his own groups. He has three Latin jazz uh, Grammy nominations. And you'll see why, when he plays his own compositions, those are well-earned. So I'd like to present, very proudly, on behalf of Spencertown Academy Arts Center, Jovino Santos Neto.
Hello, Trovino Santos Neto here. Very pleased to be playing some music for you today. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who's listening. Thank you for the invitation to play some music for the Spencer Town community. Uh, I just started off the piece, composition of my own. And this is called, it's a Batuki, which is a very kind of ancestral, very primal, primeval root of the music of Brazil that combines beats from Africa with native influences, European influences, all of that. And that one was called Tambo do Xó, which is a drum for Oxóssi, who's the guardian of the forest. And we need that. The forest needs to be guarded one way or the other. So I'm going to give you today a little, you know, panorama, all, uh, I would say an auditory panorama of some of the music from my country. And I started off with a composition of my own, but in a way it brings back to old school, the drums and the syncopation, which is basically the surprise in music. Just like life is full of surprises, the music that has syncopation has also rhythmic surprises. Um, I'm going to continue by playing composition by the great Pichinguinha. Pichinguinha is one of the greatest composers in Brazil. Uh, was born in 1897, died in 1972. 1973, I don't quite recall for sure, but his long life was really full of like music creation of all kinds. He started off as a flute virtuoso, picked up the tenor saxophone, created a completely Brazilian way of playing the tenor saxophone, different than everybody else. Also, great arranger, conductor, and a mentor to so many great musicians. So this is a piece he wrote very early in his life, but it's one of my favorites, it's called Lamentos, which is a Nowadays, we call this music shoulder music. Back in those days, it was not called shoulder. They would call it tangos, even though it has nothing to do with the Argentinian tango, that's what they did. We call this shoulder music. And this is Lamentus by Pichinguinha. <laughs> Thank you. 
harmonically for those days when people are playing music that was so much more simple in a way, but not that complicated is good, but this is such a harmonic beauty, changing chords. Mm -hmm. That's something that's not very often. People did not start hearing these kind of changes until uh, the late 40s or the late 50s. But Pichinhin was already doing that in the teens, the 19, the 19 teens in Brazil. So that's pretty amazing. What a great composer he was, and he continues to inspire all of us. Another composer that I really appreciate a lot, and I'd like to play something by him, is of course Antonio Carlos Jobim, who is uh, somebody who was heavily influenced by Pichinguin, as well as Maurice Ravel, or Debussy, and Chopin. Why not? Because he actually wrote this piece I'm going to play for you. It's actually inspired by Chopin prelude. This is... Uh, known as insensatez, or in the English title, how is sensitive. Once you got lyrics by the great poet Vincius de Moraes, for a played instrumental version composed by Antonio Carlos Jobim, or as we like to call him, Tom Jobim. Here it goes. Thank you. 
Um, so many other composers that I'd like to feature and give me some more of my work, so I guess I'll play you something of mine right now. I'll play a shoro that I composed not too long ago, a few years ago, was in Germany, Nuremberg. And uh, Germany is, uh, is the home of so much great music, and one of my favorite composers, Johann Sebastian Bach, comes from that part of the world. And there I was working with students there at the university, and I got very inspired to write a show that in a way has that kind of a vibe, you know, how shall I say, I don't want to get too technical in describing, but this is called, originally it was called Show de Nuremberg, which means the Nuremberg Show, but eventually I recorded with the name Illuminado. Hope you guys like that. Thank you. 
Yeah. That was uh, Illuminado, a sort of my composition. And uh, I love to play it because it gets very open. You can improvise in the middle. And that's another influence from Bach because uh, he was a great improviser. It's just that all we have remained from his music is the rhythm part. But the unwritten part inspires us a lot too. So I hope you enjoy doing that and that everything is fine. And uh, let me play something else now. I'm actually going to play a bayon for you. And I will actually play a bayon by one of my biggest musical influences, which is the composer Ernesto Pascual, a real musical genius uh, who is still alive at the age of 85, composing, creating music. I was very fortunate to be a member of his group uh, for 15 years, from 1977 to 1992, and uh, he shaped my musical understanding of the, the universe of sounds that he conceives. So not only to me, but everybody has passed through his amazing mentorship, has learned so much. So a great teacher, great composer, great pianist, great flute player, great arranger, writes for everything, completely self-taught. If somebody deserves the title of genius, I think Hermeto gets that. Definitely a very special person, a very special name, and a very special sound in the world of music. So I hope you guys enjoy. This is a, a bayon that he wrote called Balayu. Balayu means a basket in Portuguese. Which I love that. It's, you can put so many things inside of a basket. You can take it, you can do things with it, you can play, you can shake it. It becomes a, a percussion instrument. So this is Balayu by Hermeto Pascual. <laughs>
but I, if I met the Pasquale, I like that tune a lot. It's so, it's different than everything else. I mean, in many styles, it's very singable. It's got a gorgeous melody, but the harmonic patterns just keep shifting. It shifts keys, so keys, musical keys, so subtly that you don't really notice that it's changed keys until you find yourself in a new key. It's like a really, it's like a, it's like a story that surprises you at every turn. That's what I like about it. And this is one thing that uh, we really appreciate for the opportunity to play this music for you and to be sharing these ideas. So we're going to continue right away, play some more. This is a bayon of mine, and this is called pontapé, which means that's ponta means point, pé means foot in Portuguese. So pontapé is what you do when you kick a ball, like as a soccer ball, or as I would call it, a football. That's just when you hit with your foot. And uh, this is based on a shape of a blues, like a lot of bayon actually is inspired also by the kind of chords that the blues uses. So this kind of like it's a hybrid between a bayon and a blues in a blues form. Check it out. Thank you. 
All right. I'm going to play a waltz for you now. That's one of the styles that I like very much to play. This is a waltz that I compose called Hoping for the Day.
So like that one is a wall school, hoping for the day. Um, let's see what I'm going to play for you right now. I'm going to play a samba, okay? And this is a samba by Armando Pascual because I love his music and this is a great tune. He dedicated this tune to my hometown, which is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And this is called Viva do Rio de Janeiro, which means long live Rio de Janeiro. Brazil is right now going through such a hard time in so many different ways. And I hope that this will be a good way to send some good vibrations to my hometown and to my home country. Hope you like this one. Barometro Pascual, Viva o Rio de Janeiro. to a place that needs them badly. Let me play you a samba canção. Samba, you 
a slow form of a song. And uh, this is called Dima Sini, something I wrote many years ago, but I just like kind of almost in the feel of a bossa nova. And I uh, hope you enjoy this one. Check it out. <laughs>
To the, for today, for this performance. I don't know if you're watching it during the day or in the evening, so let's call it for today. Uh, another song of mine, this is one that I recorded in, the, in an album that was awarded uh, a nomination for the Latin Grammy Best Latin Jazz Record. This is a samba called Acerca do Macaco, which means the monkey fence. Hey, Rio de Janeiro style of samba too. And once again, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's watching. And thank you especially to my good friend, Gerald Seligman, who invited me to do this performance for you. And I hope you enjoy it and keep in touch with me. You know how to find me out there. My website is out there, all those social media handles. So let's close with um, Acerca do Macaco, the monkey dance.
appreciate you listening to my playing and I hope to see you soon sometime stay safe bye thank you so much for for putting this show together for us Jovino thank you it's my pleasure yeah so Jovino Santos Neto you are from born in Rio aren't you yes right and um and we've actually known each other for some time it was 1986 was the first time we met I remember I was um you know, down for three months doing some research and whatever in Rio and Hermeto Pascual invited me. And at that time you were in his group. You know, uh, listening to you describe the music and <clears throat> and its elements, I, I do want to reinforce that you give talks about albums and you give, you know, through Zoom. And so people should look at that on, on your uh, website yep. because can key in. What are some of the, the pieces of music you'll be discussing coming up in some, some Zoom well, conversation? Well, coming up now, this is uh, mid-April uh, 2021, in case you're watching this in the next century. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the coming up, I'm, I'm doing a series of, uh, of uh, what we call Listen In, in which I take records that I, I was a part of the team, either producing or producing and playing, and assisting Hermeto Pascual, but also other records in which I took part. And we do like listening sessions in which people get to hear the record through the ears and the eyes of somebody who was there. And uh, I got a lot of that. I once watched, I was always a fan of the Beatles, and I once got to meet Jeff Emmerich, who was uh, the record engineer for so many of the beautiful. And I, I actually got to sit with him and hang out and ask all the questions I wanted. And that for me gave me such a different deeper appreciation of that music that I had been hearing since I was a kid. So I'm trying to do a little bit of that and people are very interested, but that's not all. I also do something called Five Centuries of Brazilian Music, which is usually like 10 sessions. And then through 10 sessions, we go through all, everything from the circle dances, the African elements, the Shoro thing, the samba, the rural samba, the urban samba, the bossa nova, the jazz samba, samba jazz, the contemporary stuff, the bayon. So we kind of like break it down. And I play a lot of music and I share videos and pictures. And, and the more I study, that for me is kind of the carrot on the stick. Because when I have to do something like this, then I turn to books. And uh, a lot of the books are not really music books. They're like history books, like anthropology, sociology. 
And I try, a lot of them in Portuguese, a lot of them in English, and kind of combining. I have kind of like a librarian's mindset. So I love, and if I read something, I kind of capture something there so I can put together uh, in simple words. So instead of getting too academic and starting to talk about jargon that only some people understand, especially musical jargon, because we can talk about very complex music, but if you cannot say it in a way that people can understand, you can only explain something in simple terms when you really get it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so people can find out more about that on your website. And uh, my last question is um, how you went about putting together this program. Well, in the same way that I put the programs whenever I have to play by myself in solo settings, which this one is. And uh, it's one of my favorite things to do, even though I love playing with a band. Uh, today I'm going to rehearse with my quintet. We have a couple of gigs coming up in June with limited audience, but it's like we have not been playing together for all this year of the pandemic. So for me to play solo, it's like a way, it's kind of like what we call, it's like foraging. <laughs> I guess that's a good term. Because there's all this music which is in my mind, in my memory, by the hard drive, right? Yeah. But when I sit and I put my hands on an instrument, what's going to come out? It's like sometimes I don't even know. As I start to play, I don't even know what song it is. I kind of just build it up, or I might have some word or some association. Uh, in this particular case of this recording that I did for, for, uh, for you and uh, Spencer Town, uh, I wanted to somehow give a little bit of a chronological flow so people will get an idea to see the connections between different pieces. For instance, I believe I played the Pichinguinha, and then I played a show by me or by Hermeto or something like this. So connecting these dots, you start to see how the music exists through the time without being too, you know, here's what you should know. I, I don't try to lecture in that sense, putting the finger in people's noses and say, hey, here's some music. And it just came to my mind right now. And that hopefully will elicit, will inspire people to search more, to know more about the music, to ask questions. Go to my website. All those things are good. And, and on your website, they'll see that you have three Grammy nominations for Latin jazz. Yeah, that was something that was, uh, I really am proud of that because uh, the, the, the Grammys, in this case, was the Latin Grammys, the Latin Recording Academy. But it, it's a really a peer review. It's none of this is like a popularity contest, how mm -hmm. many records you sold. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more about people who heard this music, people who are involved in playing this music and listening to music, heard it and they thought it had value. So that kind of uh, a recognition for me is very, I mean, it's very rewarding. I feel mm -hmm. honored to, to be in that because I'm also, in a way, it, it honors not just me, what I've done, kind of like the chest thumping thing, but it's more like this is the music that I represent. I think that uh, I've been living in the United States now for almost 28 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I think I'm more Brazilian than ever. So the, the longer I stay here, the longer I go deep into the music of Brazil, I feel that I'm, I'm more from Hellengo, from Rio, than ever, even though I'm totally embedded as a resident of the Pacific Northwest. I have web feet, as we say, here, you know, with the rain and everything. I love the weather. And I love being here, but I'm also part of my, you know, as we were just talking about, he had a beautiful line, the one he wrote and saw the, the samba of the airplane, the samba do avião. As he's a, approaching Rio, he says, minha alma canta, he says, my soul sings, I see Rio de Janeiro. I have that when I go to Rio, of course. But I also have that when I'm approaching Seattle. I also have that when approaching London. I also have that when approaching Zurich. I also have that when approaching New Orleans because now I was able to expand the concept of home. Mm -hmm. So instead of like, oh, you left Brazil, that kind of thing. No, I didn't leave anything. I'm still there. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about, uh, I want to talk about Brazilian music in general and also how you put together the selection, which was, um, you know, so, so wonderful for us with kind of a, a walkthrough of a, a mini history of Brazilian music. Mm -hmm. But starting with Brazilian music, um, when you, th 
to an outsider, you know, there are several things that strike you simultaneously. One is the fantastic rhythm and the rhythmic complexity, and the other is the harmony. Two very different elements. So what is it that you think makes Brazilian music so unique? <laughs> Great question. Thank you for asking that. I always say that the patron saint of Brazilian music should be Napoleon. <laughs> Because uh, what happened is that in 1808, Napoleon, of course, his, his, his dreams would be to govern Europe from Portugal to Russia. It would all be his play, playground. And he almost, he almost managed. He got all the way to the, to the edge of Portugal. So in 1808, Napoleon was coming. He was already in Spain, crossing the border into Portugal, which is a tiny country in the Iberian Peninsula compared to Spain. So what happened is that the British helped the royal family, the court of the Portuguese royal family, which is an empire, with the colonies in Africa, colonies of uh, Hawaii and, and uh, China, Macau, Goa in India, all the spices, you know, uh, Timor in the Indonesia, all that was Portuguese colony, plus all the, the African colonies where they would send slaves to Brazil. But any, anyway, when the family, the royal family, came first to Salvador, but soon after to Rio, Rio became a seat of an imperial European right. court. That's something a lot of people don't know, which is that the, the, the Portuguese royal family yep. came there's to a, Brazil. There's a so. beautiful book called The Empire Adrift, which is, that tells that story by a British uh, historian. Anyway, uh, so that connection made it possible. They came in 1808 and they stayed until 1821. And then in 1822, Brazil became independent from Portugal. So during those years, there was a big, as you know, the royal families uh, are all married, intermarried, you know, the houses, you know, they married, tra -da -da. so there was a lot of connection with the Habsburgs from Vienna. And if you know anything about music, you know that in the, in the 18th and 19th century, Vienna was like the place. They were the great patrons. Yes, of course. They had all the, you know, the Esterhazy, the you know, Mozart, the Beethoven, all those people were there. And the, the music that was generated, not just as a place that the music came from Vienna, but Vienna was like a gathering point of the music from Eastern Europe, from Poland, from Romania, from Hungary, and also the music from a more Western parts, like the Schottisch from Scotland and the Spanish tinges, you know. So all that came to Brazil, uh, primarily starting with the Austrian composer called Sigismund von Neukon, who came in 1816 to teach music to the kids of the court so they would not be kind of like stuck in the backwater of the colony. And that, the, the partnership of the, the Portuguese with the British also meant that the British wanted to that unload a lot of pianos. The British wanted to export. So the British were making a lot of pianos. And in the mid 1800s, people, visitors to Brazil, would say Brazil is the country of pianos. You walk everywhere at night and you hear piano music coming from the houses. And it was part of the education of young girls to learn how to cook, how to sew, to play the piano, to entertain the guests. So there was also, especially after the independence of Brazil in 1822, a very nationalistic uh, drive to have music that sounded Brazilian, but it was still harmonically and uh, structurally the music of Europe. We still play polkas, mazurkas, schottisches, waltzes, but now with the Afro-Brazilian swing to it, the suspension, right? The springs are much different now because, uh, for instance, if you have, uh, uh, there's a beautiful show, we used to call this music, in the 20th century, it got the name Shoro. In the 19th century, they would call them polkas, tangos, whatever they call. And if you hear something like, uh, for instance, uh, there's a beautiful one called Flor Amorosa, which is 1865. And if you play it as a polka, it sounds kind of like this. That's like a polka, right? But then people would play it and they play like. So now it has a different kind of like suspension. It's like a car that goes, oh, it has a lot more swing to it, right? 
it's so, closer to, um, to ragtime in, in a lot of ways. Exactly. That, there's a very interesting uh, parallel between when the, the musicians in the, in the South, they'll say, let's rag it, which means mm -hmm. they'll play the same tunes, but they rag it means it had a swing, a different mm -hmm. kind of swing, but uh, a very interesting connection between that culture and the Brazilian culture is actually the American composer Louis Moreau Gottschalk, who was the very first published American composer. And uh, he, he is from Louisiana, and he came down to Cuba, and he was really involved in the whole danson in Cuba, the whole scene, and he ended up in Brazil. And uh, he died in Brazil, actually. He lived the rest of his life in Brazil. And uh, he made a lot of connections between that. I call that the internet of the 19th century. It's the Atlantic Ocean, the shipping routes. Mm -hmm. So every time, you know, ships and the harbor towns were exchanging this music. So you could have like a dance that would prop up in, say, Lagos, Nigeria, or Dakar in Senegal, or Montevideo, or Buenos Aires, or Rio, or Recife, or Havana. Or Martinique used to be a big harbor there, got blown up at the volcano. So this, all this, and Cape Verde, of course, was kind of the hub of that network of shipping lines, <laughs> New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, so, so you're talking about a lot of the elements that way, went into it, and yet Brazilian music has such a distinctive personality of its own. W what is that personality? What is it that makes it unique? Well, uh, it has a lot of the same elements uh, from, uh, let's say, for instance, compared with the music of Cuba. Cuba is a super amazing, rich musical culture that uses a lot of the Nago and Yoruba West African uh, traditions that came to the same people that were brought to Cuba were also brought to Brazil. The thing is, Brazil, given its dimensions, the continent is such a huge country. And also the fact that with Africa, there was almost like a straight parallel. I always say it's two grand pianos, South America and Africa, kind of like a, they fit and then they split apart. But uh, ecologically speaking, like the environment, so a lot of people that came from Africa to Brazil found a, 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 the plants and the animals and the foods and the cassava and the corn and the beans, a lot of kind of things that you could have on both sides of the Atlantic. And also gave me a much wider, let's say, a key, what we call quintal, like a backyard. So slaves could run away from the farm. If you're in Cuba, you run away from a farm, you're on an island. <laughs> Very soon, you, you got to go back because there's nowhere else to go. But in Brazil, you go way into the hinterland. So there were pockets of like development. For instance, uh, what we call quilombos, which were like autonomous African communities of escaped slaves living way in the interior. In Alagoas, actually very close to where Hermeto was born, there was one called Palmares, yes. which was in existence for like 95 years. So this is like amazing to have 95 years, almost a century, of an African independent state inside of Brazil. Also, another aspect that makes Brazilian music be, have its own flavor is that in the same way that Rio is a very cosmopolitan harbor, and we got influences from everywhere not just from the Portuguese, but also from the, the French and the English and the American and the Arab, all the Arab immigration of Lebanese and Syrian in Brazil came through Rio. And then you have the northeastern part of Brazil, in which actually that preserved an almost medieval Iberian culture, which is heavily influenced by Persian and Arab cultures, mm -hmm. because they were there for 750 years in the Iberian Peninsula. So we have modes and scales and instruments like the viola, which is a really funky 10-string guitar that doesn't, it's not something you had in Vienna. <laughs> it was yeah. something very, so we, we combined not only the European harmonic templates and the structural templates, such as the rondo form, for instance, that's prevalent through all the music of Europe. We call like a AABCA. That's the, uh, so the, the three-part music that was perfect for dancing because you, you know exactly how long the dance will last. So mm -hmm. you could have a minuet dancing or what we call square dancing, quadrilla, which is like, and that had forms that were, so that came to Brazil. But it also was a very strong component of West African circle dances. That means that groove, that what we call samba de roda, 
the rural samba, the samba played in a circle with people clapping their hands, drumming, and the repeated call and response. And with its kind of Arab, Iberian, Middle Eastern, combined with the medieval tradition of the troubadours, the romantic, lyrical. That, because there's something, Brazilian music is not just all, hey, happy carnival. There's right. a sentence, I mean, Vinicius de Moraes, our greatest poet, one of our greatest poets, always said, o samba é a tristeza que balança. It says, samba is the sadness that swings. So there's this element of nostalgia, of what we call saudade, the longing for something, which of course, with a huge population thrown in from Africa, that kind of, we call it banzo, you know, the, the longing for something which is gone. Yeah, and yeah. also the longing for a person or for you when you were young or for the place where you come from mm -hmm. with so much migration given to drought. So this kind of, the elements of the mix, I consider Brazil in a way to be like a giant funnel, like a giant funnel. And then there's like somebody was just pouring all these cultures and it kind of like, it just spread out through the country so much that regionally Brazil is very different. The culture from the south culture from the, from the east, from the north, from the northeast, from the west. Everything is very powerful, but very, like Minas Gerais is its own culture. Mm -hmm. In the mountain states of, of Brazil, it's totally different than everywhere else. The music of Minas sounds different, including the Baroque. We mm -hmm. had Baroque music contemporary with the German Baroque because they had a very strong Jesuit. The priests were teaching. The, the communities of native Brazilians to, 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 to sing this polyphonic four chorales, you know. They were kicked out in the 1700s because their, their concept was too socialist for the Portuguese. <laughs> this is really fascinating what you're saying. I'm really, I'm really enjoying to, listening to you talk about the, about the music. I mean, another thing that's so remarkable with all these elements is that whenever Brazilian music seems to uh, uh, adopt a style, it adapts it. It's never a, a, a repetition or an imitation. It always becomes intrinsically Brazilian. Yeah, and the DNA, the DNA. DNA is very strong. Yeah, yeah. It comes out there, yeah, uh, and that has been the history. Uh, when we play the polka, it's no longer a polka. Right. If well, we like play jazz, it's no longer jazz. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, one of the pleasures, I, I got to know uh, Jobim very well when I worked in Brazil and before, and, um, and I interviewed him a lot of times, but, you know, I was talking to him a, a similar kind of question about the Brazilian style, and he said, well, he said, my style is samba canção, style suicidal. Jobim's <laughs> <laughs> quotes are always amazing, yeah. Oh, he's so funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, um, he was brilliant, and as a matter of fact, right now, as we speak, I'm doing an arrangement of a beautiful show by Jobim called mm -hmm. Meu Amigo Hadamez, which he dedicated to Hadamez in Atali. When Hadamez was alive still, he made, because Hadamez made one for him called Meu Amigo Jobim, my friend Jobim. So Jobim retributed by doing a, a, a song in the style of Hadamez to Hadamez. He was beautiful for that. It takes a great musician to make a tribute to another musician and not just copy his licks, right? Mm -hmm. You have to like catch the essence, but put it in your own way. And I'm doing this for a quartet of saxophones from the south of Brazil. And well, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about how, how people can hear more of what you're doing and what you're up to. Mm, well, my website is always there. If you Google my name, usually I, I, I was saying I'm, I'm glad I'm not called like John Brown or something like this. That there's so many people the same name. There, there's a couple of other Jovinos out there. There's actually a Jovino Santos from Cape Verde. I became his friend because once I got a check, a royalty check, it was supposed to be his, and I, I returned it, so he became my friend. Uh, but uh, there's not many. So if you Google Jovino Santos Neto. I guess invariably you're going to land either my Facebook page or my website. And of course, everybody can get the spelling of your name from this very uh, YouTube. Yeah, video. and I, I can just send you my, my website uh, uh, and then you can just put a little uh, yeah. subtitle there mm -hmm. and people can go there. And, and I'm always active. One thing that I like about music is that it's a full-time gig. I mean, every day I'm making music in many different ways. I might be composing, I might be just performing or I might be arranging, or I might be teaching. 
and, or I might be lecturing on, on, on the history of music. So right now I'm kind of a freelancer. I right. was associated with a college for 26 years, but now I'm kind of like, as we say in Brazil, bicho solto. I'm a loose animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a couple of more things I want to ask you, but but it was very interesting what you did showing the two styles of the polka, what, what would have been played in a European style and a Brazilian. Do me a favor, show me, a, show us another one of what the, the, the piece would be in, in a European style and what Brazilians do with it. Well, uh, there's a lot of music that kind of follows this. Well, the music that we know as Choro yeah. has that and that the Choro music uh, carries on the, well, how shall I say? It carries on in the harmonic and melodic, and also this is music that was originally instrumental. So yeah. it's music that was originally played by flutes, saxophone, uh, not saxophone, flutes, clarinets, violin. So it's music that had tended to have a lot of notes, as in tapa 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 ta. When that music got combined with the circle dances that were vocal music that included a lot of call and response, as in, and everybody, so that kind of, and then one person comes in and becomes a soloist by improvising, and this comes a tradition that we call coco in Brazil. The coco music was circle dances. So the shoulder started to capture a lot of this circle dance influences in the sense that we have stuff that, for instance, I'll play you something. Uh, this, I'm not even know if that's one of the ones that I played. Uh, to be sincere, I don't recall what I played in that recording because it was all so fluid. Yeah. It just came to my head and just like it came, it went. It's like water, just under the bridge. But for instance, this thing here, like. So this kind of stuff, this could be, you know, uh, and I'm not the first one to do that. As you know, Villa Lobos took also that influence from Bach and he made the famous Bachianas Brasileira, which is like taking the, 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 the beautiful and then he puts that in a way like the famous Bachianas number five. He took like nine cellos and makes it sound like a giant guitar. He played, but then instead of being one guitar, it's nine cellos. So it sounds orchestral. And he has a, one of the most beautiful melodies, you know, of, uh, that he wrote for the great Bidu Sayon, who was a famous Brazilian soprano in New York. But he wrote a melody that she had to sing with her mouth closed. So instead of, ah, she has to sing. And that was so hard. I mean, I'm not a singer. Forgive my attempt, but uh, she had to sing this in front of nine cellos with her mouth closed. I mean, it's um, unbelievable. So it, you know, Villa Lobos did that. That's an interesting thing in Brazilian music, how it, it is <clears throat> in this kind of um, instrumental music like choro, which means to cry, and I guess that's for the sentiment of the music. The the uh, but um, that it is this midpoint very often between a classical and a popular. Mm -hmm. And somehow taking, you know, uh, so much charm from each and creating something, into, you know, a third thing, which is entirely new. Yep. It's really, uh, uh, you can, when you listen to the music of Brazil, if you study the history, uh, you can pick out the strands. 
oh, that little, like a DNA, kind of like, I, 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 because I'm a biologist still, <laughs> I still think like you're really choosing the DNA. Okay, this one came from Vienna. Okay, this one came from Mali. And this one came from, so you start to, but then when you combine it, it sounds like Brazil. It doesn't sound like any of those. Yeah. So the, the, the expression, what we call the phenotype versus the genotype, which is, so the phenotype of this music is uniquely Brazilian. When you listen to it, you see that, I don't know what that is, but it sounds Brazilian. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a flavor. And in, in a way, it doesn't matter what the listener's background is. Perhaps the listener's background is classical music, but perhaps you, you, you love dance music. You're also going to like it. Or maybe you like catchy melodies. You're also going to like it. Or maybe you like very complex structures with harmonic uh, modulation, surprising. You're also going to like it. Yeah. And if you like rhythmic complexity with several layers of rhythm, what we call the harmony of rhythm, right? In the same way that in Vienna, we develop like a very, the, the polyphony of multiple beautiful modulations and key signatures and chords that had uh, four notes, five notes, even six notes. Well, we have the music of West Africa, especially from Ghana, Nigeria, Benin, that has four or five, six layers of rhythm. So it's the harmony of rhythm. Simpler on the harmonic side, but so complex on the rhythmic side. So we got it. As I said, that funnel was able to capture the complexity of the rhythm from Africa, from not just from Africa, but also from things that came from India, Pakistan, through the north of Africa, to the Iberian Peninsula, to Brazil. So the kind of, that kind of, now a music has an amazing similarity to a lot of things from the music of Mali, the music of Morocco, Tunisia, Algiers, all that when you are Algeria. So when you listen to, to that, I I feel my DNA resonating with that. And you were in his band for how many years? Fifteen years straight. Fifteen years. And you started at what age? I started at twenty three. Again, when I was in, in Rio, I was working in Polygram and, and you guys were recording for it. And one of the pleasures was, you know, that the recording studio was right there in the office building. So uh, office building, I mean, it was a, you know, a low building in a suburban area, Tijuca, um, Baja de Tijuca. But I remember I used to hang out and, and uh, recording sessions and listen. And for example, I heard a lot of the Juan Gilberto when he was recording the album for Juan. Yep. And, and then I heard that you guys were going to be recording an album. So um, it was amazing how quickly you put down the basic tracks for, yep. for the entire album, two nights. Two, that was exactly two days. We got the entire basic tracks of the whole record down. And yeah. the, this is very complex music, music that had you know, multi-layered parts for drums, piano, saxophones, flutes. And the, uh, what happened is that the month previous to the recording, as a matter of fact, Jean Gilberto recorded right before us. Yeah. And we came right after him in the same studio. Um, we spent like a, at least a month or two months in our rehearsal room playing only those songs because it was right in the beginning of the year. So around Christmas, New Year, there was no gigs. So all we did is spend every day playing those tunes at different tempos. We had like a, instead of a metronome, we had a sample of a giant cowbell. So it was just like a bang, 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 something like that, uh, more cowbell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would play this music, which constantly changing tempos and changing meters and changing textures so many times. So therefore, when we walked into the studio, it was like, okay, recording, one, two, three, four, everything is pretty much one take. I remember thinking exactly that, that, you know, this is what happens when you've got a band that rehearses six days a week for all the hours that you did, which is that you come in the studio and just... I remember I and the engineer and the producer, oh, well, you, it was self-produced. You know, we, our jaws dropped, just like hearing this amazing concert where you were all playing together in one room live. Yep. Uh, well, it, it's a kind of like, it was an evolution. When we went to make this record with Polygram, we were for the first time in the city where we lived, because we lived in Rio. So we did all the rehearsal in our studio, in our rehearsal studio. And when we landed at the, uh, 
at the Polygram Studios, as you said, it's like, no, let's go, one, two, three, four, boom. Next tune, one, two, three, four, boom. So in two days, we'll lay down all the tracks, and the hair method does this magic, right. which is like to, you know, the overdubs, the little details, I think. And I, that record, I mean, I produced it, so I was able to follow. When we, we did it in Sao Paulo, I would help with the basic pre-production, but then I will go back to Rio, and Matt would stay alone in Sao Paulo with the engineer, doing all the the finishing up, you know, the the, the post-production kind of things. Uh, but this time I, I was actually there through the whole process, and I learned so much as the, you know, what to do, what not to do in the studio, that kind of stuff. So Armento is really good. I mean, it, his visual deficiency helps him a lot in being in the studio, and because he's not looking at anything, he's mm -hmm. not looking at screens or... He's just basically hearing the sound. He can say, no, I want a little bling, a little bling. And yes, well, yes. And hey, we're, we're, we're uh, remiss. We haven't mentioned the, the title of the album that we're talking about. This is called Festa dos Deuses, which means the fest or the party of the gods. Mm -hmm. It was something that I remember when we were talking about uh, the title. And people say, oh, the religious people are going to be upset because you say there's actually many gods. So Hermeto says, yeah, every musician who's developed to, to a certain extent becomes a god of music. So this is dedicated to all the musicians. And very rare thing is that we actually play a cover, which is uh, uh, Thelonious Monk's Round Midnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one thing that Hermeto always loved Thelonious Monk so much. So for him to to reharmonize around midnight and it's a completely different arrangement of what a song normally is. As a matter of fact, this thing is also an arrangement of round midnight. Hermetra has done like three or four different reharmonizations. The mm -hmm. one we recorded is one of them. We've done another one for Big Band, several others that never got recorded or anything. So there's a big story of Hermetra and Monk. Hermetra would say the Monk could have been born in the Brazilian Northeast because of the kind of melody, especially in round midnight, that's the line that goes like this. That's a, that's a typical Northeastern phrase. Monk is from the Northeast. Nobody will tell me otherwise. <laughs> so listen, Zerovino Santos Neto, thank you so much on behalf of Spencertown Academy Arts Center for putting together this program, spending all this time chatting. I mean, what a, what a pleasure it is to hear a musician of your caliber walk us through some of the, the, the gems, the prizes of, of Brazilian music and, and musical history. Thank you. So uh, it's, it's just wonderful having you, and I look forward to our being in the same place at the same time one day. I so. miss New York. I got to get back. I actually have, I, I'm supposed to do a recording session. Uh, I don't know when, maybe July, maybe later, but no, but I, actually I'm a, a commission for three pianos. So it will be three pianists. That's pretty social distance because we're nine feet away from each other. That's right, right. But uh, we still have to find, maybe the recording is going to be a purchase. I don't know yet. It's going to be some studio, maybe in Jersey somewhere. But uh, I hope that if I, go, if I go your way, I'll let you know. You do that. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you, okay. my friend, Gerald. Take care.